Explore S. Time traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. In part two of our day as an ancient Roman woman, we discussed our dads and our husbands, explored our domus, and life as a Vestal Virgin. Now let's step away from Vesta's sacred flame and back to our lives as patrician matrone. Out into the streets of Rome we go. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Anna, Becky, Chloe, Emily, Gaia, Jackie, Jessica B, Kayla, Mikkel, Morgan, Olivia, Sarah, Stephanie, and Wendy. And my lady presidents, Amanda, Amy, Brendan, Audrey, Belinda, Caroline, Cassie, Claire K, Claire S, Courtney, Courtney H, Dana, Debbie, Diana, Edie, Elizabeth M, Elizabeth G, Elspeth, Ellie, Eve, Jeanette, Jessica S, Caitlin, Karen R, Casey, Kat, Kelly, Kelly F, Kim, Larissa, Lauren, Lori, Louisa, Mary, Meg, Nancy, Nicole, Paul, Pamela, Sasha, and Townsend. And to the Imperators and Augustas who donate more each month than I've asked for. Avery, Karen C., and Jackie C. Becoming a patron really helps keep the show going, and you'll get access to sneak peeks, discounts on merch, and exclusive bonus episodes. To find out more, just go to my website. All in all, we definitely seem to have more freedom to roam about than our Athenian counterparts. We can go and watch debates at the Forum, attend public games, chariot races, and theatrical performances. We wealthy women travel outside the city to go to summer houses when Rome gets a little too steamy. Some military wives even go out into the field with their husbands, though a lot of ancient writers are rather horrified by that. And though some of Rome's stodgier gentlemen think it's improper for us to take an active role in public life, and we have to be careful how we go about it, we certainly do have a presence here. Because we are well off, we'll probably be carried around the city in a litter by some of our slaves. We're almost guaranteed to be accompanied by our husband, a male guardian, or just some servants. But this one time, we'll get wild and head out on foot so that we can see the sights. As we wind down our hill, which is one of the seven in Rome, things get more crowded and chaotic. Rome's quite famous for its highway system, which stretches out for some 50,000 miles throughout the empire. There's a reason for that old proverb, all roads lead to Rome. But inside the city, most streets are likely to be made of dirt. Most of those are thin and winding, with a bit of a modern-day Venice vibe, along with a lot of shadows and definite risk of fire. Don't count on relying on street signs, there aren't any. If you have to ask for directions the Romans feel, then you should probably just get the hell out. The Seven Hills will provide a helpful point of reference, though. And in terms of checking the time, we've got little more to go on than a sundial. The only thing you really need to watch out for is the setting sun, because our city has no street lamps and you do not want to be out after dark. Let's head over to the Quirinal Hill, which is known for its shopping. As we go, we'll pass a teeming mass of humanity. About a fourth of our city is designated as public space, townhouses make up another third, and the rest, which is a lot, are insulae, apartment complexes with six to eight apartments per block. These are often crowded and cramped since rent is expensive and many people sublet the rooms they don't strictly need to pay for it. Insulae can get up to seven stories high with rows of shops down on ground level selling everything from fruit and veggies to pots and fabric. Wave up to your friend Drusilla who is watering some plants on her first floor balcony. She's lucky. If you have to live in one of these buildings, the first floor is the place to be. It's the best insulated, the easiest to escape if there's a fire, and the most convenient to carry your things to and from. These places are small and way less fancy than our house. Most women don't have the luxury of cooking, bathing, or going to the bathroom at home. So we'll see a lot of them out and about, shopping and eating at taverns. Smell something funny? That's probably human refuse. 
Some of our streets are less than fresh, flowing with trash and other waste. Some streets even feature little stepping stones that allow you to hop across without having to soil your sandals. You'll also see some large amphorae on a few street corners placed there by fullers. You know, those people who starch our clothes. They need urine donations so that they can have a steady supply of uric acid to do their work. Pea starched palas for everyone. One thing you can count on is a whole lot of noise. Rome is a loud city, tradesmen banging metal and blowing glass, shopkeeps shouting about their wares, people catching up on every corner. There is nowhere in this city, wrote Marshall, where a poor man can have a quiet moment to gather his wits. Along our way, we might stop to read the news. Rome publishes one of the world's first newspapers. It's called the Acta Diurna, or Daily Acts, etched into metal or stone and put in public gathering places so that people can make sure they're up on the business. In it, you'll find everything from info about military conquests or gladiatorial bouts and the price of grain. That is, if you can read Latin. And luckily, way more people can read and write here than in either ancient Greece or Egypt. Such things aren't just for scribes and priests. How similar is the Roman Latin to the one we learn in school in our century? It's harder-edged, but you're likely to recognize a lot of the words that helped make up what we call the Romance languages. Though I can guarantee you now that you're going to be confused by the fact that Romans don't space out their words like we do. You might also be baffled by Roman names. Let's explain briefly, as this is going to help us later. Most Roman men have three or four names, a praenomen, which is essentially the name your mother would call you by, then a gens or clan name, so everyone knows which family you come from. This situation means that a whole lot of fathers and sons are walking around with the same first two names. Gaius Julius meet Gaius Julius, because that won't get confusing around the dinner table. To avoid such situations, we often get a nickname or cognomen. Some examples of these are strawberry which means squinty, Cicero, which means chickpea, and Caesar, which means curly-haired. Caligula, who we'll talk about later, means little boot and is a childhood nickname he probably grew to hate. Helpful hint, if a name ends with A-N-U-S, like Julianus, you know that person has been adopted, which is something that happens a lot in the imperial family to ensure succession. It will surprise you not at all to know that we ladies tend to have just one name. Can you guess what it's based on? Our gens, or family name, of course. So if dad's nomen, or family name, is Cornelius, yours will be the feminine form of that, Cornelia. If it's Agrippa, your name will be Agrippina. If it's Scribonius, unlucky you, you will be Scribonia. I don't see that one making a comeback. If you have more than one daughter, the Romans don't feel it's necessary to reinvent the wheel here. We'll all have the same name, which means you might have three Julias at the dinner table, distinguished by birth order, major, minor, or tertia. Julia 2, pass the salt. Julia 3, stop your pouting. How convenient. We won't see any graveyards on our journey through town, as no one but Caesars and the Vestal Virgins are allowed to be buried inside of Rome. What we will see is shrines, temples, and a whole lot of phalluses. Public penises, you say? Indeed! Much like over in Egypt, Romans consider an erect male member to be good luck. The Latin word for such talismans is fascinum. Fascinare means to use the power of a fascinus, or essentially to enchant. That's where we get our modern-day word fascinating from. Their common function in the Roman world is to ward off evil, so you're likely to see a whole lot of them, carved into walls and painted red, bread baked into their particular shape. And you thought that penis cake mold you bought for your best friend's bachelorette party was never going to get used again. I've even read suggestions that some Roman generals ride into town during their triumphal processions holding one such model, just like a phallic foam finger. That is indeed pretty fascinating. So you'll find them as personal charms, often with wings, because why not? On pendants and rings, turned into penis lamps, you'll even find swinging bronze phalluses over doors with little jingly bells. It's good luck to touch them, so don't be shy. Give that manly rocket ship a pat. Everyone else is. 
Keep in mind that Rome isn't very safe. It will not be making the most livable cities list anytime soon. Crime is common, particularly after dark. You'll be considered a pretty careless type if you go out for dinner without making a will, says the satirist juvenile. This town is full of violent drunks who can't sleep well until they've beaten someone up. Take this little scene. You see that those of lower status, including slaves and servants, are using their belted tunics as a built-in fanny pack, dumping their shopping right down the neck hole so they can carry it home. You watch as one of them cries out. A thief has cut his belt off, letting his treasures come tumbling out. Whoops. So what happens if we need to stop and pee? For men out and about, there are paid public toilets. These are essentially just a bench with a bunch of holes punched into it, featuring a stream running under it to wash all of our refuse away. While it's true that our city's cesspits and wells are often uncomfortably close together, we're fortunate to have a working sewer system. This is a thing we won't have again until the 19th century, which is pretty mind-blowing. The largest and oldest of these is the Cloaca Maxima, which is so big that you could actually sail a boat through it. Ninja Turtles, you in there? So while we may not have flushing toilets and these bathrooms are not going to be to modernize the cleanest places to pull up your tunic, at least it takes our refuse to a sewer, which is regularly flushed out by the aqueducts. Get ready to find this a cozy space. Men think absolutely nothing of doing their business precisely one foot away from his neighbor without any barrier in between them. In fact, it can be a place of bonding and business. Let's take a dump while we talk politics. As Marshall has it, He spends all day on the toilet. He's not sick. He's looking for a dinner invitation. Though the public toilet isn't without its dangers. Now and again, naughty youths upriver will light a bit of wool on fire, drop it into the little stream, and wait gleefully as their little floating bonfire passes under that row of derrieres. Burnt butt hairs, anyone? Once they've done their business, they wipe off with a sponge on a stick, clean it in a little trough of water, and leave it there for the next guy. How delightful. I had trouble finding out whether there are public toilets for ladies as well, but let's assume there are some. Unless Roman men think we don't have bowel movements, which seems like a thing they might like to believe. The other thing we're likely to see a lot of in our travels are statues. In a world without photographs or social media, they are important pieces of propaganda. They let us know who is in charge and what they look like, or at least how they want to be portrayed. For the imperial family, it's important PR. You'll see both men and women looking down at you from their stony pedestals, and as we mentioned before, they aren't white, but brightly painted. Some are even made with detachable heads, just in case it's damaged and needs replacing. Or if that emperor falls out of favor, we can just chop off his head and turn him into someone else. Pay close attention to any statues of imperial ladies, as the newer ones may help us know what kinds of styles we should be emulating. We may not have OK Magazine, but we do have that giant likeness of our current empress to go on. Speaking of her, we might as well meet our first lady and her emperor. His name is Trajan, and he's going to usher Rome into the peak of its power. The empire is as big as it's ever going to get right about now, stretching from Scotland to the Persian Gulf, and he's so popular that the people call him Optimus Princeps, or Best Ruler. As his wife, Pompeia Plotina, she of the giant hair poof from part one, gets to bask in his reflected glory. She is quite a shrewd empress. Like many before her, this well-educated woman knows how to conduct politics from behind a shiny curtain. It's said that she's the one who gets her husband to choose Hadrian as his successor. Some say she even poisons him to get Hadrian into the top spot early. This is a nasty rumor that many imperial women will suffer under. But we'll save all that imperial intrigue for some future episodes. For now, know that these statues can tell us a lot about the world we're living in. It's likely that we'll pass by or through the Forum, and we should. Surrounded by important temples and buildings, it's at the very center of our city. This is where people come together to discuss the news, buy and sell goods, register newborns, and generally do their important business. This vast space is full of important-looking statues and the rostra, the podium where people get up and make speeches. This is Rome's political heart. 
And while we ladies can go and watch legal proceedings, of which Romans are very fond, we will not be casting any votes, speaking on the rostra, or snagging any political seats in the Senate. Most of us don't have any part to play in our legal process. We may influence our men from behind hands and curtains, but we do not have official power in this sphere. But we have evidence that, of course, women do have political opinions, particularly when it comes to their family members, and that they aren't afraid to make them known. Some graffiti from Pompeii illustrates this point nicely. I beg you to make Lucium Popidium Secundum Edile. His anxious grandmother, Teria Secunda, asks it. But still, our citizenship does not give us the right to participate in our government. That's our husband's job. Most ancient writers think we ladies shouldn't have such rights because, after all, we're really quite frivolous and easily manipulated. As the lovely Seneca puts it, mirroring an argument we'll be hearing all the way through to the Victorian era and beyond. Men and women contribute an equal share to human society, but the one is born to command, the other to obey. Oh, Seneca. I'll have more to say about you later. But here's the thing. Just because we can't vote, it doesn't mean we don't have power and influence. Take the battle over the Lex Appia. From 264 to 146 BCE, the Republic engaged in a series of three wars with their enemy, the Carthaginians. And if there is anything we know about war, it's that it disrupts the regularly scheduled program and gives women a chance to step into the roles their husbands have vacated. While the men rode off to war, battling both men and elephants, Roman ladies started stepping up, taking over businesses, making contracts, and generally accruing their own damn wealth. Concerned by the alarmingly large number of women making fortunes and taking up roles in business and enterprise, in 215 BCE, the city's rulers passed a wartime austerity measure called the Lex Appia. It's a sumptuary law which controls what people are wearing. But not just any people, it's specifically aimed at curbing what women can wear and do in public. The Lex Appia makes it so that women can't own more than half an ounce of gold. They can't rock multicolored tunics, particularly if they're purple. And they certainly can't ride around in horse-drawn chariots. It's wartime, after all. It's supposed to be about curbing extravagance during wartime, but really it's about controlling women's wealth and thereby limiting what's seen as a disturbing power. Cato the Elder thinks this is only right, as women are taking Rome right to hell in a handbasket. Our ancestors refused to allow any woman to transact even private business without a guardian to represent her. Women had to be under the control of fathers, brothers, or husbands. But we, heaven preserve us, are now allowing them even to take part in politics and actually to appear in the forum and to be present at our meetings and assemblies? Rome eventually defeated Carthage, emerging as the Mediterranean's new superpower and bringing game-changing spoils rolling in. So now we can get rid of that hateful Lex Appia. Except the men in charge were quite happy to keep it going, thanks kindly. The wealthy matrons, however, were having none of it. And those who wanted to repeal the law butt heads with the conservatives who wanted to see it stay. In 195 BCE, they marched on down to the Forum. They weren't allowed to vote or to speak on the rostra, but damn if they were going to stay home. Women came from way out of town for the occasion, turning it into an ancient Roman women's march. Cato was horrified, of course. He gave a super lovely speech up on the rostra, probably wagging a finger all the while. Citizens of Rome, if each one of us had set himself to retain the rights and the dignity of a husband over his own wife, we should have less trouble with women as a whole sex. He says, As things are, our liberty overthrown in the home by female indiscipline is now being crushed and trodden underfoot here too in the forum. It is because we have not kept them under control individually that we are now terrorized by them collectively. What are they now doing in the streets and at the street corners? Are they not simply canvassing for the proposal of the tribunes? and voting for the repeal of the law? Give a free rein to their undisciplined nature, to this untamed animal, and then expect them to set a limit to their own license. Unless you impose that limit, this is the least of the restraints imposed on women by custom or by law which they represent. What they are longing for is complete liberty, or rather, if we want to speak the truth, 
complete license. No doubt, Cato. Of course, the guys who opposed the law were only slightly better. A dude named Flaccus countered Cato's suggestion that women wouldn't fight amongst themselves if they didn't own anything by saying something along the lines of, How do you think Roman women are going to feel when they see the wives of Rome's Latin allies wearing jewels and finery when they cannot? Yes, Flaccus, this is all totally over whether or not I get to wear my favorite jewels. But then there are others who argue that women have done this before. Didn't the Sabines intervene to stop a war between their husbands and brothers? When Rome fell to the Gauls, didn't the women ransom it? In other words, women were a means of ensuring the public good, and always had been. But they didn't just cluster around the rostra, as Livy tells us. At last, they ventured to approach the consuls and praetors and other magistrates with their demands. These women took to the streets, pressuring men with power to repeal the law, or perhaps intimidating them into submission. In that moment, and for perhaps the first time in Rome's history, they revealed what can happen when female power was wielded. We have evidence that other women get up and speak their mind in legal matters. There was Hortensia, who we spoke about in Part 2. There are also women like Amasia Sentia, who Valerius Maximus tells us, pleaded her case before a great crowd of people, pursued every aspect of her defense diligently and boldly, and was acquitted almost unanimously in a single hearing. There's also Gaius Afrania, the wife of a senator, who Maximus tells us often repped herself before the praetor because her impudence was abundant. Okay, Maximus, why don't you go sit down? So, don't despair. Your voice does matter, even if you can't ever step into the Senate House. Now it's on to Rome's famous Colosseum. That incredibly impressive oval-shaped amphitheater can hold at least 50,000 people, has an awning that can be pulled out on sunny days, and, as ancient sources tell us, is occasionally flooded to hold mock naval battles. Despite what we might think, not everyone is obsessed with the bloody entertainment to be had there. Fights between men and women and animals, public execution in all sorts of guises, and epic gladiatorial fights. But such stadiums can be found all across the empire, and they are a central part of it. They hold many people in thrall, so we'd better stop in and have a squint at the carnage. Luckily, we're women, so we'll be relegated to the cheap seats up in the nosebleed section, and thus won't be able Able to see what's happening in super great detail. Brutality and violence are common enough in the ancient world. War is baked into the Roman self-image, and they turn it into public spectacle too. Often victory is celebrated with similarly violent entertainment. In 107 CE, after winning two bloody wars against the Dacians, Emperor Trajan will take some 10,000 prisoners back to Rome and have them fight in gladiatorial games. 123 days of murderous fun, fun, fun. Not all of them die in the arena, but in these big events, plenty do. Most of the unfortunates you'll find in the arena below are actors, prisoners, gladiators, and slaves forced to fight to the death. It's worth noting that these events aren't happening every day. Records indicate that the Empire's 400 venues see about two big shows each year, which means that the Colosseum isn't always game on. But when it's on, it involves what our modern sensibilities are going to find quite brutal. If you're an animal lover, this might not be the place for you. We will see many beasts pitted against each other, and against humans as well. During the games held to celebrate the inauguration of our city's Colosseum, Emperor Titus arranged for 9,000 tame and wild animals to be slaughtered there over 100 days. Yikes. Romans revere someone who can fight well and with bravery. As Pliny the Elder says, such sights inspire people to face honorable wounds and look scornfully on death by demonstrating a love of glory and desire for victory, even in the persons of criminals and slaves. Sometimes these events are staged as plays and famous myths, just to add an air of drama. Suetonius recounts how one guy dressed up as Icarus, that gentleman from Greek myth who builds some fake wings and takes flight in them, and is then forced to leap, wings and all, many feet to his death. 
Women aren't exempt from this spectacle. Marshall tells us that one woman was forced to reenact the myth of Pasiphae, who famously slept with a bull and later gave birth to the Minotaur. All we can hope for is that this forced bestiality is an exaggeration and didn't actually happen. It does get worse, as criminals are often condemned to die in these arenas, including women. In the 3rd century BCE, a 22-year-old woman named Perpetua and her slave Felicitas will be killed in an arena in Carthage, becoming Christian martyrs because they will not give up their faith. Can you imagine walking out into the sudden sunlight, crowds shouting above you, as you wait to die by ad besties, mauled and ripped apart by beasts? No, Russell Crowe, I am most certainly not entertained. Gladiators are a slightly less depressing part of such festivities. We think they originated early in Rome's history, used in a ceremonial display to honor the dead. The word gladiator means sword, though they fight with a whole lot more than that. Anyone can volunteer to become one, but let's be honest, most are slaves, criminals, and prisoners of war. They train in one of Rome's four gladiatorial schools paid for by the state. Even Julius Caesar founded one such school. Gladiators are a pretty big business. And they are interesting characters, reviled and lowly in some eyes, but revered as champions and sexy curiosities in others. They have no legal rights or social status, but they can command whole stadiums, with everyone chanting their name. Some gladiators are even considered sex idols. One bit of graffiti in Pompeii labels a strapping male gladiator as the young girl's torment. And as our satirist friend Juvenal jokes about a runaway wife, What were the youthful charms which captivated Epia? What did she see to allow herself to be called gladiator fodder? A wounded arm gave promise of a discharge, and there were various deformities in his face. A scar caused by the helmet, a huge boil upon his nose, a nasty septic dribble always trickling from his eye. But he was a gladiator. It is this that transforms these fellows into the most beautiful youth imaginable. They're often invited to fancy banquets the night before their bouts, so the upper classes can meet and greet them. Some women are said to flirt with these potentially doomed gentlemen, but even more gloriously, there's evidence that women were gladiators too. We know precious little about these gladiatrixes, and they seem to have been fairly rare. We get only glimpses. A plaque from Halicarnassus shows two of them, with the words, Amazonia and Achillea were set free. First century historian Suetonius mentions that Emperor Domitian makes some women fight by torchlight. Many are brought in from exotic and faraway corners of the empire to take place in a bloody and rather racist spectacle. But Tacitus tells us that when Nero was emperor, high-ranking Roman women threw their hats into the gladiatorial ring. Many ladies of distinction, however, and senators, disgraced themselves by appearing in the amphitheater. It's hard to say if this is true. In 200 CE, Emperor Septimius Severus will ban all female contests, which suggests that there must previously have been some. If visual evidence is anything to go by, they fought with one breast out, just like the Amazons. And of course, the poets mock their manly bodies, because some things just never change. They remain shady figures, these women gladiators, but we can be sure that, dressed for battle and with swords in their hands, they were everything Roman women weren't supposed to be. And that would have made some people uncomfortable. As Juvenal writes, What sense of modesty can you find in a woman wearing a helmet who runs away from her own gender? It is violence she likes. And that makes her feel both exciting and dangerous. Now let's wash off all of that bloodlust with a trip to one of Rome's most glorious spaces, the public baths. We Romans are obsessed with the baths, from emperor to lowly gladiator. Many of us go daily, or even multiple times. It's a place to get clean, and a place to be seen. In the 1st century BCE, a wealthy guy named Caius Sergius Orata invented the first hot bath center, taking his cues from the natural hot springs near Mount Vesuvius. Many are small, but we're going to the giant that is Trajan's Baths, which can hold some 3,000 people within it. 
It has pools, of course, but also a whole lot more. Gardens, entertainment spaces, even a library. Here's Dr. G. People would often spend hours at the baths. It was kind of like this multifaceted area to hang out. So because you could have a gymnasium aspect to it, because you could buy snacks and have a drink, because you could socialize, because you could be doing politics on the sly, even though it wasn't strictly business time, um, there's obviously a lot of potential for communal social life to happen. So anybody who's anybody is at the bars because that's where everything's going down. So how you present yourself in that space becomes, it's almost like a, a new set for the play out of class structures, I'd say. These combination clubhouse gym spa complexes are a central feature of Roman life and are about more than getting clean. Children, slaves, and gladiators all get in for free, but the ladies pay more than men for the privilege of visiting. Rude! As we got dressed in part one, we had to keep modesty front of mind, making sure we weren't going to flash a wayward ankle. And yet men and women are both bathing in very scanty outfits. So it's like, obviously you have to get at least partially undressed. You didn't necessarily have to be fully nude. Um, some people would not be, and that seems pretty clear from the evidence as well, is that people would choose their level of nudity. And these are spaces where people of different classes mix together as well, which seems to violate every other rule we've learned about navigating our way through Rome. We find ladies aren't supposed to be working out next to a gladiator. How do we make sense of this? It helps to remember that the Romans don't see nudity the same way that we do. The expectation that you would somehow just be nude all of a sudden seems to be outside and very different from the way that we think of nudity today. And the ideas of shame that we have associated with it is something that wasn't happening for the Romans. Bathing is considered very healthful, a medical priority, so let's not get too silly about showing a little skin while we keep ourselves in good nick. And of course there are ways, even whilst prancing around in the buff, to show people our lofty status. So you would often have attendants with you if you were an upper class woman. Definitely you would want to have your slaves hanging around, they're there to protect you. And we also get the sense that because everybody's doing this, these bars are actually, in many cases, really crowded places as well. So <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> yeah, the, it's quite possible that you would want to have an entourage in order to knock other people out of the way. Are men and women bathing together or separately? You'd think that, having wrapped ourselves in so many layers to walk the streets, we wouldn't be mixing and mingling with gentlemen. It's hard to answer this question for sure, but it seems to change over time. So we've got some evidence, um, particularly from the early period, at least anecdotally, to suggest that in the beginning the Romans were really ashamed of nudity. And so we have like Plutarch's uh, Life of Cato the Elder, where he talks about how he wouldn't bathe with his son, and he wouldn't bathe with his son-in-law, and in fact communal bathing was just a no-no because everybody just felt too ashamed. Um, so that's quite early Republic. And we also see from the architectural remains of early baths that they were two separate sort of parallel structures. So the same sets of rooms, so like going from like the warm to the hot to the cold and things like that, were run in a sequence so that men and women would just never see each other. But then as we shift into the imperial period, so Augustus and the Julio-Claudians, we start to see what seems to be a really clear and marked change from this separation of the architecture to these more uh, public communal spaces where there's just one set of rooms and they're much larger. And not only that, there seems to be plenty of written evidence to suggest that men and women are sharing the space. A few years from now, under Emperor Hadrian, such mixed bathing will be abolished, as it's seen as threatening to moral virtue. But it doesn't seem as though the law is respected much. Though there are some who say that bathing with women can be dangerous, including Plutarch. Men should not cleanse their skin in the women's bath. Men must not be naked together with women. In addition to indecency, certain effluvia issue from women's bodies and excretions which are defiling when absorbed by men. Anyone who enters the same air or water partakes of them. 
It seems at all other times that women will visit the baths during designated hours and men will visit at others just to make sure we don't cross paths. Sometimes men are kicked out if a woman wants a little quiet soak time. We have this instance where there's a Roman military camp and what happens is that one of the wives of one of the consuls comes about and says she wishes to have a bath um, and there seems that there are only men's baths. Um, so they do a quick clean. Uh, <laughs> they're like, get out, everybody. Get all the kitties you know, out. <laughs> the consul's wife wants to have a bathe. And they're like, shoo, everyone. This whole issue is charged and apparently hotly contested. Some say that it's only lower class women who bathe with men, actresses and ladies of the evening. Others say high class ladies are there as well. It's probably something that varies facility to facility, so make sure to check if you're concerned about who might see you naked. We might also work out before we bathe. Yes, we ladies are fond of the gym. We might engage in ball sports, weightlifting, or a sort of ancient volleyball, wearing either a tunic or the equivalent of a bikini. Here's Dr. Rad. In terms of women working out, there is a particularly famous image that you'll often see that springs up around this, and that's uh, the bikini girls. Um, so whenever you hear like, anyone talking about underwear or clothing or anything like that, you'll see this image of these two girls and, and what they're actually doing um, in their little banded clothing, uh, you know, like a little strapless bikini it looks like, is, it seems, working out. Like one of them seems to be holding a discus or something like that. I've posted that mosaic in the show notes if you're interested. We might even get a spot of waxing done. This is one of the reasons that the baths are apparently so loud. When lodging over one, Seneca the Younger complained, When the muscle men work out with their lead weights and start to strain, you can hear their grunts. Then a ball player arrives and starts counting his shots. At this point, I give up. Add the hooligans looking for a fight, the thieves caught in the act, and those who sing at the top of their voices in the baths, Then there is the hair removal expert screeching out his services, shutting up only when he's dappilating an armpit and someone else is doing the screeching. After that, we'll enter a sweat room, then a hot bath, then a medium hot bath, and then a cold plunge pool. We might even treat ourselves to a massage while we're at it, clearing out those toxins. This paints a pleasing image for us time travelers, but these places aren't as crystal clean as you're imagining. Emperor Marcus Aurelius calls them places full of oil, sweat, filth, and greasy water. There's also the suggestion that we might be having some sexy playtime while bathing. So we have some possibly uh, uh, sexy evidence um, <laughs> oh, yes. from, from Ovid um, <laughs> and his Ars Amatoria, where he talks about girls going to the baths with their slaves um, and the secret joys that can be had uh <laughs> Whilst bathing. Oh, of it. <laughs> <laughs> Juvenal gives us this satirical picture of a woman who's all about her bathing time. She leaves her dinner guests and she goes off to the baths. She's like, I'll be back. She <laughs> loves the hot baths and she especially enjoys working out. Um, so she's getting her gym time. But not only that, she then goes for a massage, um, which is all about a very skillful masseuse, um, if Ooh. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Happy ending, I'm guessing. <laughs> mm. And and once she's uh, got a fresh glow about her, she goes back home. <laughs> ah, Rome. <laughs> uh. Now that we're clean, relaxed, and probably getting hungry, it's time to settle in for our biggest and fanciest meal of the day. Dinner is a big and social affair, meant to be shared with friends and family and clients. That means we're pretty much always either throwing or going to a dinner party, so let's refresh our melting makeup, slap on our best wig, and hop on over to a friend's house. This is not going to be a quick little sit-down. Such dinners are more salon-slash-wedding reception than quiet family affair, with both food and entertainment rolling on into the night. Though not too late, as remember how dangerous our streets are. Imagine trying to walk home at night in your closest metropolis with no electric lights or lampposts to guide you. It's no wonder crime's such a serious concern, not to mention getting lost in the dark. 
These banquets can last up to six or eight hours. Another place to do deals, make friends, see, and be seen. We ladies will only ever be invited over with our husbands, never alone. Single ladies aren't having their own dinner parties either. A real oversight that I'm glad the passage of time has corrected. We'll dine in a room called the Triclinium. Take your sandals off at the door and check in with the Triclinearcha, an ancient maitre d', who will escort you where you need to go. The room is nicely decorated, with a colorful mosaic on the floor and murals on the walls, and it's probably open on one side so you can bask in the splendor of a garden. We will not be eating dinner in chairs. Instead, couches are arranged in a horseshoe shape around a central table, each one meant to fit about three people. You will dine quite close to your neighbor while lying partway down and propped up on one elbow. Choking hazard? Maybe. Shoes off and reclining, a slave might wash your hands with some rose-scented water while we chat, and then we're ready to eat. What exactly can you expect to enjoy at this feast? The first course, or the gustus, might feature eggs, a salad, arugula, or rocket is popular, as it's said to be an aphrodisiac, salted fish, or dormice. Yes, you heard me, dormice. These edible rodents, which are a lot bigger than the house mouse you're thinking of, are sometimes kept in terracotta pots in the kitchen and fattened up for just this purpose. They will be either roasted, dipped in honey, or stuffed with pork, pine nuts, and spices. A bite-sized treat with a tail! Yummy! Next comes the main course. We won't enjoy a whole lot of mead unless we have money. Chicken, pork, and beef are all the most likely candidates. Fish is expensive, so isn't quite as likely to feature. But since we're fancy, we'll have all sorts of oddities to choose from. If you're not a fan of animals stuffed into other animals, this part is likely to disappoint you. Pig teats stuffed with sea urchin, anyone? How about a Trojan pig? A suckling pig stuffed with all sorts of other meats. Snails are a delicacy, bred on milk on special farms for your fine dining pleasure. There might also be peacock's brains, sow vulva, flamingo, or even a giraffe leg. Alrighty? You'll be comforted to know that, because we don't use forks. Everything is served in shared bowls in bite-sized pieces, so you can pick and choose what you like, shoveling it into your mouth with the fingers the gods gave you. Get your taste buds ready, because our meal will likely be heavily salted and spiced. When you don't have refrigerators or an effective means of preservation, salt is a valuable commodity. There's a rumor going around that soldiers are paid their salarium, or salary, in salt. At least that's what Pliny the Elder tells us. Regardless of our class or socioeconomic status, we're likely to find garum on the table, a fermented fish sauce that's akin to anchovy paste mixed with balsamic vinegar, and which, I suspect, would send me running for the nearest spittoon. But it has the advantage of giving any less-than-fresh ingredients an all-over sweet and sour tang. To be clear, this is a rich gal's dinner. Our friend down in the insule is eating much simpler fare. Our house has its own kitchen, but most people take their state-allocated grain straight to a bakery to get their bread, as they don't have the facilities to make it at home. They are eating stews and porridge, not peacock brains. And they're eating them at fast food bars called Thermopolia. Dinner would be a loud and social time down in the streets and in taberna, or taverns, which sounds fun, if you ask me. But back to our couch. For the vegetarians amongst you, there will be loads of vegetables and cheese on offer. Because the empire has grown so vast, we'll likely see some exotic ingredients too. Spices from Asia, dates from Africa, walnuts from Persia. Fruit and honey feature heavily, used as flavoring agents. Things you won't find, tomatoes, potatoes, rice, chocolate, distilled liquor, and pasta. While those at the taberna are drinking red wine mostly, our dinner party is likely to feature a lot of white. Our wine is very concentrated and super strong. Pliny the Elder says that a fine wine called Falernium will catch fire if you touch a flame to it. So we're going to water it down before serving with either spring or even salt water. We might also add some herbs and spices to liven things up. Mulsum is a white wine spiced with honey, which would probably be akin to what we think of as a dessert wine. We might also sweeten it with something a little more edgy. Lead acetate, also known as sugar of lead. There's much debate among scholars about how big an impact this had on the everyday Roman, and if we're consuming enough of it for it to act as a poison. But I might still inquire with your couch buddy about whether or not it's been put in. 
There is a lot of etiquette to wrap your brain around. Italians will invent forks at some point, but remember, that isn't what you'll be using. That's why the slave currently hovering behind you keeps trying to pour scented water over your sauce-soaked fingers. You will also need to ensure you've brought your own napkin, which might later serve as a take-home bag for leftovers. But what is that other implement, you wonder? The one with one end flat and the other curved. The pointy end is meant for picking your teeth, and the spoon-like end is meant to be used to clean your ears in front of everybody. Yep, that guy beside you is getting all up in his earwax. But there is an upside. There are a lot of things we can do at this dinner party that no one will judge us for. We can throw our bones and food scraps directly onto the floor. No biggie. Belching is actually a sign of civility. Farting? Also totally fine. Just don't be alarmed if at some point that earwax picker beside you snaps his fingers, beckoning over a slave with a blown glass bedpan where he can alleviate himself of all that wine. Oh my. Both during and after our meal, there is likely to be entertainment. Readings, music, little plays, maybe even some gladiators who come to do a bit of sparring. And now that the host has brought out some sexy dancers, we find ourselves with more than food on our minds. It's while watching these dancers and trying not to be grossed out by the sight of Marius picking his teeth when we see a beautiful man across the room. That man is, of course, Tom Hiddleston. You didn't think I'd left him at home, did you? He is giving us serious bedroom eyes and is absolutely smoldering in his toga. Gods have mercy! We Romans are quite famous for our loose morals and casual post-dinner orgies, so are you going to be able to indulge in some horizontal tennis time with this Brit-accented Roman? Of course not! You're a married woman. But that doesn't mean your husband won't partake. In order to understand Roman sexuality in practice, we have to try and unhook ourselves from our Judeo-Christian moral corset and open our minds to a different way of looking at sex. It's not that Romans are completely loose and lascivious, it's just that they'd look at our anxieties and rules about sex, swish a hand in the air and say, well, that's just way too complicated. Sex is a gift from Venus, they think, so we should go ahead and enjoy it. And being good at it is part of being able to produce healthy children. This attitude toward the sexual is all around us, in the phallic symbols hanging all over our city and the common sight of a pornographic fresco in someone's home. We have so many of these that we have a good idea of what kinds of sexual positions people might have been exploring. One is delightfully called the lioness, though what it looks like is something I'll leave you and Tom to ponder. Needless to say, sex isn't considered something to be hidden or ashamed of. You'll see sexy symbols everywhere, and no one bats an eye at it. But of course, especially for us ladies, it's not as simple as all that. Here's our situation. Married men can sleep with pretty much whomever they want, other women or men. Homosexuality isn't an identity in ancient Rome, but simply a sexual preference. And generally speaking, it isn't considered something to froth over. Our next emperor, Hadrian, will tour around openly with his male lover. The thing that gets Hadrian in trouble is mourning over him a little too hard, which is seen as both excessive and too emotional. We do not like our emperors to weep. Of course, that changes if we're talking about a same-sex female couple. Women with sexual urges and no desire for a phallus to be involved? That's just unnatural. Ovid finds it... A desire known to no one. Freakish. Novel. Among all animals, no female is seized by desire for female. Eye roll, Ovid. Serious eye roll. But much like in ancient Greece, the thing we are going to froth over is whether you're taking the passive role in the relationship, and a lot of that has to do with our status relative to our chosen bedfellow. Early in Julius Caesar's political career, a rumor cropped up that he was having a sexual affair with Nicomedes, the king of Bithynia. The issue wasn't that they were both men, particularly, but that as the younger and less lofty party, Caesar was playing the passive role in the affair. If you're sleeping with men of a lower status and your wife as well, you're probably fine. But if you're sleeping with men of your station and you either haven't gotten married yourself or had any children, that's going to be a problem. 
Dalliances outside of marriage aren't even considered adultery as long as our sexual partner falls into the right category. The right category means someone who is of lower status than you. If you're a highborn man, that means a plebeian, a slave, an actress, a shopkeeper's daughter. He might visit a lady of the evening at a brothel, which are called lupinari or wolves' dens. House slaves are particularly susceptible targets, which is why I suggested in part one that you tell your son to leave them alone. According to most of the men around him, it's his right to take them as he pleases. Here's Dr. Evans. But yes, certainly uh, a man's fidelity kind of doesn't exist. So, you know, s slaves are always fair game for what we would regard as, as um, sexual assault, and it doesn't matter what sex they are, and, and people of lower status too. In terms of picking a sexual partner, at the very least, they should be younger. Sometimes so much younger that our modern sensibilities are going to be quite shocked by it. But really, you shouldn't be shagging anyone who is your social equal. That is key. For men, it's also key that they always be in the dominating sexual position. He takes pleasure, but he isn't supposed to give it out in the form of oral sex. Apparently, being accused of having given oral sex to either a man or a woman is a fairly racy insult. In other words, if the Bill Clinton-Monica Lewinsky situation happened in ancient Rome, everyone would probably just shrug about it. A powerful man sleeping with a less powerful single woman? It happens all the time. But we Romans do believe in restraint and reining in our desire for excess, so this is not a nude orgy free-for-all. Being seen as someone who can't control themselves means they shouldn't have control over anyone else. Emperors who indulge in that kind of excess, like Nero and Caligula, get themselves into a whole lot of hot water. Having multiple partners and sharing lovers doesn't have to be an issue either. A grave marker found in Ostia says it holds the remains of a slave woman named Alia Potestas. A guy named Alias, who we assume had the grave marker inscribed, says that he shared her with another man, but that upon her death they stopped being friends. To us, that seems like TMI for a gravestone. I can't imagine Alia would appreciate it. There is an inscription that tells us that uh, a slave or an ex-slave, I can't remember which, has built a tomb for these two women who were hairdressers. Um, and he was probably a slave in the same household or the same business, um, and he was married to both of them. Now, they're slaves, so there is no legal marriage for them anyway, but he regards them as his wives. He doesn't say that, that they were wives in turn. I think they might have set up a little threesome together from the, the tombstone, and apparently they were fine with it. So, <laughs> so, you know, there are all kinds of other configurations going on out there. Such acts only officially become adultery if he sleeps with a married woman or a citizen's unmarried daughter. And that means, as a woman, if you fall into either of those categories, no romp with Tom for you. Why? Because it has the potential to confuse the family lineage. We need to know for sure who a baby's father is, because in Rome, everything is about those family ties. Respectable married women have to stay faithful, they have to stay pure and chaste. There's this very high standard put up for women. It's definitely a double standard from our point of view because it's not there for men. Even the suspicion of a married woman having had an affair can be grounds for divorce. Julius Caesar's wife, Pompeia, finds herself in a spot of trouble when she hosts a religious festival of the Bona Dea, or the Good Goddess. She holds this all-lady ritual in their home, but unbeknownst to her, a guy named Clodius dresses up as a woman and sneaks in to have himself a good old time. There's really no way he and Pompeia got it on during this festival, but just the suggestion that they might have spent some time together without a proper male guardian was enough for Caesar to kick her to the curb, which gave rise to a popular proverb. Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. Though really, to me, this all sounds like a convenient excuse to get rid of her. Especially since he himself was sleeping with half the women in Rome and those outside of it. Classy as always, Caesar. Women's sexuality being out of control is a worry that Roman men talk about. So there are, and they seem to sort of uh, arise during times of trouble. So there are a lot of these out of control women portrayed in the late Republic when Roman society is falling apart. So that's definitely a point of anxiety. These women who are 
going out, you know, they're just consorting with more men than perhaps they should be. During the reign of Augustus, which we'll talk about a lot more in another episode, he brings in some new laws that crack down on adultery. Believing that Romans have gotten way too loose and concerned about the falling birth rate, he tries to curb such behavior through harsh punishments. And they're particularly harsh on women. It makes adultery illegal in a very complicated and quite brutal way. So that um, if a woman is caught in adultery, and it is pretty much how it's thought of, then her husband has to divorce her. If he doesn't divorce her, then he can be prosecuted as a pimp. Because clearly, if he doesn't care enough to divorce her, then that's what he's doing. He's pimping her out. He should divorce her and he will get most of her property, or certainly she will lose I think at least two-thirds of her property, and she and her lover are exiled to different islands. And it seems he practices what he preaches. Augustus sends his own daughter, and only legitimate heir, Julia, away from the city for her supposed promiscuousness. She's rather famous to have said racy things about her sexual exploits. Like this one, which Macrobius tells us, she uses to explain how she sleeps around without compromising her husband's lineage. I never take on a passenger unless the ship is full. AKA, she doesn't bed hop unless she's already pregnant. Pregnant. Well, that's something. But all of this loud and proud sexual activity is something dear old dad can't stand, so he exiles her to an island, and she dies there. So he's not winning the world's best paterfamilias award anytime soon. And of course, the punishment for women caught cheating is the harshest of all. So if her father catches in her in adultery in very specific circumstances, then he is allowed to kill her. So that's the really brutal part. We don't have evidence of this ever happening, so we can hope it didn't. But just knowing it's written into the law is not a pleasant thought and will probably give you pause. Of course, the texts we have on what we should do in the bedroom tend to be conservative, but we know of plenty of affairs in Rome that went on for decades. And we know that we go out of our way to cast spells to keep the objects of our affection faithful, suggesting that we aren't always so. Take this little number, which was found carved onto a curse tablet. If you've had a woman, and you don't want another man ever to get inside her, do this. Cut off the tail of a live green lizard with your left hand and release it while it's still alive. Keep the tail closed up in the palm of the same hand until it dies and touch the woman and her private parts when you have intercourse with her. I mean, I'd really rather you not. If you do decide to wander into the shadows with Tom, some of our Roman physicians do give us some ideas about what we might use as a contraceptive. Sorinus says that we should smear ourselves either before or after the act with things like old olive oil, honey, cedar, pine bark, sumac, wine, and white lead. Great idea. And while there are many and varied opinions about abortion in Rome, and how late is too late to perform one, there are doctors who write about it. There are suggestions from some that you just need to jump up and down and click your heels a few times. Soreness breaks it down into two steps. First, you have to soften the lady palace with vaginal suppositories to get everything nice and relaxed. Then you need to give yourself a vigorous shaking. He specifically shouts out the benefits of a shake by means of draft animal. So, there's always that? There's a lot more to say about sex in ancient Rome, but let's leave something to the imagination. <sighs> Sorry, Tom. Maybe next time. Now we're home and getting ready for bed. What happens if we're feeling a bit sick after our night out and we fear it isn't just a hangover? We might think about calling a doctor, but if you're a time traveler in Rome, it's really better that you don't. Our medicine is heavily influenced by ancient Greece, so there's a lot of overlap between our practice and theirs. While there are hospitals for soldiers, most people are being attended by physicians at home. As with everywhere in the ancient world, disease is common and life expectancy isn't what you're used to. As we've said before, a lot of children die before the age of five, and there are a whole lot of diseases we don't have treatments for, at least not ones that are very effective. 
That whole four humors business is very much alive and well in Rome. That idea that our bodies are dominated by four different forces that need to be kept in balance. That means we're all about bloodletting, purging, and very strange enemas. So, like I said, maybe just drink some tea and leave the doctor to his business. We also believe that miasmas, which travel on the air, are the reason a lot of us get sick. At least that inspires us Romans to appreciate the value of clean water and bathing. We have all sorts of medicines to work with, and some well-known doctors writing treatises on what works well and what might not. They use a cornucopia of ingredients, some of which might be helpful. Saffron, myrrh, pepper, cinnamon, poppy. Woad, that stuff that British warriors use to paint their faces blue, is great as an antiseptic, and we do a mean version of calamine lotion. Cato the Elder feels strongly about the medicinal properties of cabbage. He says that the best way to ensure a kid grows up healthy is to bathe him in urine regularly from someone who eats a lot of cabbage, though it's hard to know how seriously we should take this advice. The physician Celsus says that hot plasters of mallow root boiled in wine will take care of that gout from all of your overindulging. We know that we do have some female doctors floating around, and perhaps that's best, as Roman men are confused about how our female bodies work. Many prescribed to that wandering womb theory we encountered in both Egypt and Greece. The idea that a woman's womb migrates around the body, causing mischief and general hysteria, and often has to be scared back into place. Sometimes being a lady also gives us special powers, they think. Our time of the month especially turns us into scary creatures. Pliny the Elder wrote that, Terrible things are told about the monstrous power of Menzies, whose magic I have already discussed, of which I can repeat the following without embarrassment. If the female force begins to flow in a solar or lunar eclipse, the harm will be irremediable. Even if there is no moon and sexual intercourse is pestiferous or fatal to the man, purple is contaminated by menstruating women. So much the great is their force. He also said that a nude menstruating woman could prevent hailstorms and lightning, and even scare away insects from crops. So that's neat. For period pains, Celsus has many potential remedies. One is to have someone pour cold water over you. That'll work. That's probably better than having someone rub mustard onto your stomach until it turns red or fumigating your womb area with sulfur. No thank you. Since medicine in this age can only go so far, there are prayers and amulets to go with them. Green jasper is supposed to be good for curing stomach pains, and okotokia stones are a surefire way for an expectant mother to encourage a quick birth. One found amulet has magical formulas on it, as well as a symbol representing the uterus. If you had a mind to, you could use a key to open and close it, which is supposed to either make you open to conception or close you off. I mean, don't knock it till you've tried it. Speaking of which, while we aren't giving birth just now, let's talk about what it might be like for us. Just like over in Greece, women will give birth surrounded by female midwives, not male doctors. I mean, we wouldn't want another man touching our wife's sensual tidbits. We won't have any epidurals and very little by way of sterilization. So as with all ancient births, this is a perilous time. But I'm excited to tell you that at least Sorinus suggests that midwives wash their hands before delivery. With hot olive oil, which is not soap, but at least it's something. We deliver our babies in a birthing chair, whose seat has a crescent-shaped hole in the bottom so that the baby can pass through. If all goes well, we will soon lay our baby at our husband's feet, and he will decide whether it lives or dies. So again, we're back to the power of the paterfamilias. But just because he dominates so much of what happens, it doesn't mean we can't set our own goals and achieve them, and that we can't leave a mark on our world. And with that, we'll take off our wig, collapse into bed, and bring an end to our ancient Roman day. What an epic journey! 
but it's far from over. Next up, we'll try to pull back the curtain from some of Rome's most famous women. The wives, mothers, and sisters of emperors and other important political figures. Exploring their lives and the different ways they found to navigate their way to power. What was life like for Livia as Rome's first empress? How did well-protected Empress Messalina end up murdered in a public garden? How did Agrippina the Younger stay alive when so many members of her family couldn't? Then go on to become the most powerful political female force Rome had ever seen. Let's put ourselves in their shoes and try to bring alive their stories. As much as I would like to get new episodes out before the holidays, work commitments, travel plans, moving house, and my perfectionism means you probably won't hear from me again until the new year. But if you're a patron, fear not. I'll be releasing my full interviews with Dr. G, Dr. Rad, and Dr. Evans over the next few weeks to keep you busy. Have a happy festive season. Until next time. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It really helps me keep the show going, and it gives you access to exclusive deals and bonus episodes. Some of the ones coming up will include my full interviews with Dr. Rad, Dr. G, and Dr. Evans, which you won't want to miss. You can also leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, which helps new listeners find me. Another way to support the show and get yourself a fetching present is to check out the Explorers merchandise shop, where you'll find lady-centric timelines, detailed maps, and women's history greeting cards and art prints made just for you. To read the transcript for this episode, plus a full list of my research sources, lots of images, and more, just go to this episode's show notes on my website, theexplorerspodcast.com. You'll also find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Explorers Podcast and Twitter at The Explorers Pod. A huge thanks to Dr. Rhiannon Evans, Dr. Rad, and Dr. G for going time traveling with us. If you want to hear more from them about ancient Rome, look no further than their podcasts, The Partial Historians and Emperors of Rome. You'll find links to both shows in the show notes. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael Levy, who composes music using recreated lyres from antiquity to give us beautiful glimpses into the ancient world. To find out more about his work, check out the show notes. Thanks, as always, to Mr. Explores, Paul Goblonsky, for my theme music, logo, and the amazing graphics he keeps patiently making for the Explores. And thanks to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Phil Chevalier, John Armstrong, Sean from the excellent podcast Stories of Your and Yours, Paul Gablonski, Simon Dinatris, Andrew Yourgold, Avery Downing, and Ray from the Woman's Planning Podcast. 